Hi folks, Wooden Boat Dan here. Just wanted to give you a heads up. The podcast you're about to listen to was recorded several years ago. So some of the phone numbers, email addresses, website, links, and time-sensitive information are no longer valid. Please keep that in mind as you listen. If you'd like to contact me, my email address is woodenboatdan at gmail.com. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Hooked on Wooden Boats weekly podcast episode number 105. I am your host, Dan Matson, a.k.a. Wooden Boat Dan. If you can't do it, nobody on this planet can. And this is the world's first podcast fully dedicated to celebrating the art, craft, history, and tradition of wooden vessels around the world. Breaker, Breaker 19, how about you, South Bend? You got a copy on the paper maker? Bring it back. <laughs> Not sure where that came from. Oh, I, actually, I do know where that came from. That was 1976, driving from Springfield, Missouri to St. Louis, Missouri, using my CB radio, channel 19, K, KAPJ 2423, talking to the truckers on my four-hour commute to St. Louis to study to take the Becker CPA review course to study for the CPA exam. <laughs> I just had to do that once, folks. I don't know why. It was uh, That was a fun time. I would stay awake talking on my CB radio to truckers from Springfield to St. Louis. That was a good time. Anyway, welcome to the podcast today. Great to have you on board. Today's featured segment is an interview with Jay Smith, and this is the third in the Interview the Expert series, where I'm interviewing experts about different boat building methods, and today Jay is going to be discussing the lapstrake slash clinker method of building. Jay is very well qualified to do that. He actually studied in Norway the Nordic method of lapstrake construction and has been building lapstrake boats for 35 years or so and very knowledgeable. So stick around for that interview. You're going to enjoy it. If you haven't listened to the Carvel Planking interview with Jeff Hammond, that's episode number 99 of Hooked on Wooden Boats. And last week, episode 104, was with John Harris from CLC Boats talking about the stitch and glue boat building method. This is really fun stuff. I enjoy doing the interviews and asking the questions because I've dabbled in different methods myself, and it's a lot of fun. Upcoming highlights, November 20th, 2013, I'm going to be teaching my class at the Northwest Maritime Center on their Wooden Boat Wednesdays. Imagine that, Wooden Boat Dan at Wooden Boat Wednesday. <laughs> How could you go wrong with something like that? Anyway, on the 20th from 12 to 1.30, I'm going to be teaching my class, Build Your First Wooden Boat. And basically, I'm going to take the class that I presented at the festival a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to modify it a little bit. And I'm pretty excited because I'm also making some props where I'm actually going to pass around and show, physically show what stitch and glue construction looks like, strip play construction, carvel planking, uh, six different methods, actually seven including lap stitch, which is a stitch and glue method for lap straight construction. So I'm really excited about teaching the class again. I actually emailed my buddy Jake Beatty over there and said, Hey, Jake, what do you think? And he's like, Yeah, we'd like that. So I got in touch with Molly, and we're getting it set up as we speak. So if you're anywhere around November 20th in Port Towns and swing by at noon, actually, they like for you to call ahead of time and reserve a spot. And uh, we're going to have a good old time talking about building wooden boats. Which brings me to my next topic. I did release my first ebook on August 15th called A Guide. No, what's it called? (laughs) It's a long title. Get in the Wooden Boat Game, A Guide for Building Your First Boat. Costs $4.99 on my website. It's a PDF download. You can buy it there or you can go to, well, the quickest way would be to go to hookedonwoodenboats.com slash ebook one. 
and that'll take you to the page where you can add it to your card and purchase it. 100% money back guarantee. If for any reason you're unsatisfied, actually, I don't think unsatisfied is a word. How about dissatisfied? You get a full refund, no questions asked, and you get to keep the book. So it's kind of a win-win deal, I think. So check it out. Also, my website, I have a book called The Epoxy. What's it called? It's Epoxy Tips and Tricks. It's by Russell Brown, who's an expert with epoxy, teaches you how to do fillets and all kinds of cool things, and it's $5.99 on my website. If you go to my homepage, you'll see it there on the right-hand side if you're interested in that one. Also, little scamp update. I am working on the rudder now. I actually uh, assembled, or I hauled out the rudder, added some lead shot, about two pounds, have uh, epoxied the two pieces of the rudder together. Now I'm getting ready to glass the blade. And I'm glassing portions of the head, not the head, the the cheeks inside the rudder head. I guess it is the rudder head. I don't know all the technical stuff, but (laughs) I do know how to build it. So I'm working on that. So that's pretty cool. I'm into the boat now about 200 hours and about $4,400. So I am going to keep working on it. And she is for sale. I'm also thinking about what I'm going to build next. I'm thinking possibly a kit kayak, maybe another scamp. There's lots of possibilities out there. It's kind of fun to think about them. Okay, I'd like to give a shout out to our new subscribers this week, Tom Larson and Rob Schultz, who have just subscribed to the monthly e-newsletter and mail list which basically you get a monthly newsletter from me with some fun stuff, and then occasionally I'll send out an email uh, telling you where I'm going to be and giving you other tips and tricks and things like that. Fun stuff, so I would encourage you to sign up if you haven't already. You can go to hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash subscribe. As you know, this podcast is about getting in the wooden boat game which everybody needs to get in. And unfortunately, only a small percentage of the world is in the game. So my job, mission one, is to get more people in. So if you're listening, you're not in yet, or you're getting a toe partway in, keep listening because you'll be in diving in head first after a few more episodes. We're going to move on to the interview with Jay Smith now from Anacortes, Washington. And we're going to go over some specific questions about the ins and outs of lap strake boat building, also called clinker boat building. So take it away, Jay. It's August 26, 2013. I am on the phone with Jay Smith of Espoia Boats. Jay, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah, so this is uh, one of my series on Ask the Expert, and today we're going to talk about the lap strake, lap strake or clinker method of building. And Jay, you've got uh, deep, deep roots in this type of building, so let's jump right into it, Jay, and talk about the history and description of the lap strake method. Yes, good. Ooh, there's a lot of material, uh, but to put it in some sort of uh, framework, the earliest examples that we have of lap strake construction are are in Denmark, in Jutland, and these are boats that were built in the first, second, third centuries A.D., uh, and uh, they were built of oak. They were, some of the early ones were plank keel boats, so they were built the way we think of a pram today, not, not a, a rigid uh, keel, but a, but a plank for the keel, and then, and then uh, strakes on either side of that. They were, uh, they were built of oak, and the early ones were stitched with birch and yew withes, or uh, small sapling roots, or saplings themselves. Um, there is uh, one faction that believes this lap straight construction evolved uh, from the, the the skin boat 
which was a stitch type of construction, the curras of uh, Ireland, which were uh, hides stitched together over a, a, a bent wood framework. So whether that is there's a direct evolution from skin boats into lap strake is something that can, of course, be debated on and on. But, but the early lap strake boats were stitched uh, because this was in the beginning of the Iron Age, and for a lot of people, iron was not available yet. And uh, as, as time moved forward and iron became more available to the common people, rivets uh, were made uh, available also, and uh, smiths could make up a few hundred rivets and, or uh, enough for a small boat, and then the stitching went away and rivets became uh, the way to fasten the planking. Um, by, the, uh, by the 5th century and the 6th century, the plank keel uh, was replaced with a T-shaped keel or a vertical uh, keel that had much more strength and directional stability. And it really changed uh, the seaworthiness of the boats and also the strength of the backbone. Um, also, the plank lines at that time became more refined. Um, boats were still being built of oak, uh, but some in the northern climes were uh, experimenting with the use of Scots pine, a lighter material. And with the T-shaped keel, the advent of iron rivets, and these more refined plank lines, larger boats and ships were being built. And this was just before the, the Viking Age began. So this was still in Denmark, Jay? This Denmark, uh, this was all across northern Europe, uh, central and northern Europe, I would say. Certainly uh, Ireland, uh, England, Scotland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and, in, and along the northern coast of Europe there as well. So that's, that's really the, the ancient history, and then when everything really blossomed was during the Viking Age. And uh, they made great use of that T-shaped keel, uh, iron rivets, of course. Uh, in this first 750 years or so of lap strake, the, the framing was lashed to the, to the, the planking. Uh, so there were no through-haul fastenings for the frames, and they they stuck with that method, lashing framing, for many hundreds of years. But the Vikings uh, branched out a little, developed trunnel fastening, and uh, soon enough left that lashing method behind because it was very labor-intensive and, and demanding of the materials available. And in the second half of the Viking era, the ships were trunnel fastened, Iron riveted, uh, oak planked for the most part, uh, rigged with uh, um, one mainsail, and uh, also powered with a series of oars on both sides through oar ports. And uh, the lap strake method remained popular certainly through all of the Viking period. And then at the end of the Viking era, uh, it was still widely in use for trading vessels. Uh, into uh, the Middle Ages when, uh, when Carvel construction really uh, took over and that uh, tradition became the preferred method for shipbuilding. What year was that or what century would that be, Jay? Well, we, we can... Uh, we, we know that uh, into the 1400s, um, uh, lap strake was still the preferred uh, method and... Uh, uh, large shipyards were beginning at that time to experiment more and develop more of the Carvel ship construction. Uh, that was the really big, the big ship uh, with the high uh, stern and the high forecastle uh, that we think of as those very early uh, ships of exploration uh, coming out of Italy and then Portugal and Spain uh, just before the the uh, age of exploration. So, uh, Really, lap strake was the method in Western Europe for boats and shipbuilding from uh, 
before the time of Christ through 1500, I could safely say. And uh, and then it uh, has still been very popular for small boats um, right up until these days. I see. And so describe for us what exactly lap strake is, for those that don't know, Jay. Uh, lap strake is uh, a planking method f- uh, which involves um, one strake, of planks, which is a round of planks, a full round um, uh, on the ship, and uh, the planking is overlapped. Uh, each each plank uh, laps about an inch to an inch and a half over the upper outboard edge of the plank below it. So it's very simple. It's um, um, a very uh, logical way to build up the sides of a vessel and fasten the planks to directly to one another as one uh, moves up the side of the hull. And because the planks are fastened along the edges the full length of the vessel, that adds a lot of strength to the boat, is that right? Yes, it does. Each of those longitudinal laps uh, adds a good <clears throat> bit of strength and rigidity to the vessel, which uh, Carvel plank planking does not in that the Carvel planks are are butted uh, and stacked, so to speak, on top of one another. Okay. And so because of the because of the longitudinal strength of the strakes, then the internal framework can be a little different. Is that right, Jay? Yes. The, the internal framing can be much lighter because of that. So the, uh, the strength is shared uh, by the the skin or the planking itself and the framing and the framing can be of lesser scantlings and uh, not so frequent frames uh, throughout the uh, interior. And when the boat is built, is it built uh, right side up or hole up or, and what, uh, what is it built over if anything, Jay? There's quite a variety uh, in uh, in building methods, and that really depends on the tradition that one's working in. Um, in some countries, in England, uh, for example, uh, it's quite common to build small boats um, upside down over a series of molds, which determine the hull shape at station lines or um, points along the hull. And so we one sets up a backbone and inverts it upside down over the molds and then begins planking with the garboard at the keel and planks essentially towards oneself and down towards the floor. Um, that is an English tradition, and maybe in uh, many other countries as well, and it is probably the preferred modern method to build lap strake. But, uh, but originally, if you imagine boats being built on a beach, for example, which was so very common, uh, with a forest at your back for materials, uh, building was done very much by eye, and a few large blocks would have been set up on the beach, and the backbone would have been uh, hewn out, chopped out, fastened together, set up on some blocks upright, and planking would begin again at the garboard, uh, at the keel, and and the builder would have the ability to to see the the shape of the hull evolve in front of him um, upright and c- could very easily make decisions about the hull shape uh, as he moved along with the planking. And so that's the traditional method, is upright. And certainly in Scandinavia, um, almost all of these vessels were built upright. And even today, uh, most builders uh, of lap strake in, in Norway and Denmark, uh, I know, build in the upright position. So if you build in the upright position, is there anything inside the planks that's holding anything in a certain position or anything, Jay? Or how does that work? It can be done uh, with, I've seen builders who use one or three uh, thwartships molds, 
to give them some uh, some um, direction for hull shape at those three points. Uh, other builders don't use molds at all, but use uh, a series of offsets just to give them the width of the hull at each strake as they move up and at maybe three points uh, forward and then midships and then aft uh, in uh, 20-footers, for example. So molds can be used, uh, but um, for more experienced builders, they really aren't necessary. And um, the one thing that that is necessary in this type of construction is a a strong back above the boat, or a beam, if you will, placed... uh, just a bit above the uh, the tops of the bow stem and stern post, uh, from which one can shore down to force a plank out and hold it into position until it's completed and fastened. Uh, and so that's become uh, uh, the standard method uh, once people moved indoors and had the the option of putting a beam overhead. Now, is that how you're building the, the Viking ship at your place there, Jay? Uh, in many ways, it's all the same. Uh, even though what we're building here is a 56-footer, uh, we, we have to achieve the same, uh, uh, the same hull shape uh, by forcing the planks out at certain points to get the correct lay of plank and in each strake. Uh, we don't use a strong back above a 56-footer. It's just uh, too cumbersome. And the Vikings, uh, building on a beach, would not have had that option either. And so they uh, used a couple of different methods. One was to use heavy stones and lay them on the, on the hull as they moved up, uh, use, simply using gravity and weight to their advantage. Another was uh, a, a sort of odd-looking... Uh, um, very, very large clothespin, which is a large piece of oak with a notch in the end, which slips over the plank and then has a line on it and allows one to to uh, twist the plank and force it out or force it in board and then fix it, uh, lash it to the ground, to a stake in the ground and hold it there. Those are methods that are used out of doors. And, uh, of course, in building a 56-footer here, we're, we're uh, forced to use the same, some of those same methods. And they work great. They're, they're just fine for larger vessels. But for small boats, it's, it's most uh, efficient to have a, a strong back and uh, an overhead beam and then uh, be able to shore down with short uh, one-by-ones. Okay, very good. So what level of skill is required for lap, lap strike building, Jay? I would say that uh, one really only needs to have average woodworking skills to build uh, a small lap strake boat. The skills that will that will be developed during the construction are are really uh, available to I think most any woodworker. Um, there will be, of course, a learning curve, and there will be. Uh, um, some some uh, specific tasks that need to be uh, refined and nearly mastered early on, and there'll be some struggles to to figure those out because there are rolling bevels and there are some some uh, rolling facets that need to fit perfectly one against another, and those can be the early frustrations. But once a person has um, has figured that that gain and that rolling bevel, the the lap uh, of the planking, has has got that in his mind and understands uh, how he has to get there uh, and gets a couple of them just right. It it then it becomes uh, rote and uh, and I think uh, it doesn't require advanced woodworking skills to do this. It probably requires uh, patience, perseverance, and dedication to the project as much as any kind of level of woodworking ability. 
And a little bit of, I mean, you would gain an understanding of geometry and, and working on the gains and bevels and all that, right? Well, of course, that. Uh, also, x-ray vision is quite helpful. Uh, and, and, if, and if a person can, uh, can, can visualize uh, two pieces of wood coming together and fitting perfectly and, and uh, determine where to take the wood off each piece so that they will join one another in a matching pair... That's really uh, a, a helpful uh, key, and, and it comes uh, in and of itself. The more you you work uh, on on this kind of construction, it will come automatically. Uh, but it's a struggle in the beginning. I know f- from my own experience that it didn't come quickly, and there were certain uh, periods of extreme frustration when I just uh, didn't get the joints as uh, as perfect as I wanted them. But over time and with uh, uh, more and more experience and more and more uh, planking, uh, it begins to really take shape beautifully and, and one understands uh, the end result needed and how to get there. Okay. Jay, are there any uh, special tools, equipment, or materials needed for this type of building? Uh, yes, there are. They're all uh, available uh, to most people, I think, uh, uh, these days. And it's not a long list, but it is a specific list. I, I'm, uh, I'm always rather amazed when I go back to, to the old country and I step into uh, boat building shops and I, I look around at the benches and I see the paucity of tools there are a couple of planes here and a couple of chisels there and a spoke shave over here uh and they're building these beautiful 25 foot lap strake vessels and a couple of hammers on a table at the you know back by the stern post or something really not very many tools needed to pull off the task at hand um what i if i maybe i should just run through a quick list would that be helpful Dan? yeah you bet let's do that uh, for those who are uh, considering uh, building a small lap strake on their own, uh, the best uh, hand planes are a number four uh, bench plane, a number five, a jack plane by Stanley or Bailey. Uh, look for the older ones. They're always the best. Um, and a low angle block plane is uh, critical for the last pass and just uh, finishing the edge. A rabbit plane is really helpful uh, for the gains on each end of the boat um, at the hoods. A uh, selection of good chisels, uh, various sizes from half inch on up through a, a good uh, long two inch small slick is useful many times. A spoke shave is a must uh, and a good mallet wooden mallet uh, with some heft to it, uh, not huge, but, but a good medium-sized mallet, hardwood head, uh, back saw, and a handsaw. Just a small handsaw will be adequate, uh, but, but a handsaw is, is ample uh, for a lot of the cuts that you need uh, in just cutting off the planking rough and then some finer cuts also. Riveting and backing hammers for the riveting process, uh, 14-ounce cross peen for the peening, and a backing hammer, and you, there are several ways to to go on that. You, you may have to have one manufactured by the local uh, blacksmith or machinist, and they're fairly simple. Uh, and then also a pair of clipitong, or uh, I guess in this country they're called nippers, for nipping off the shank of the rivet before peening. And I think with, uh, with a, a list like that uh, filled out, a fella could uh, begin building and uh, probably pick up a few other things along the way. But uh, I think you could build a boat with that set of hand tools. Very cool, very cool. And Jay, uh, is lap strake best suited to any particular shape or style of boat? Uh, with the exception, 
with the exception of Viking ships, lap strake is mostly considered for boats under 36 feet. Uh, and over that, uh, most builders uh, build in Carvel. These are mostly open boats uh, and often, uh, most often, rigged for sale with two or four, six um, oars. So both uh, rowing and sailing. Uh, but but essentially, lap strake is most popular under 36 feet. And the boats are typically double-ended boats, right, Jay? Uh, I would say a majority are, and certainly the most aesthetically pleasing are double-enders. And uh, again, that could be debated. But uh, transoms really didn't come into use until the late 19th century. Uh, until that time, almost all uh, fish boats were double-enders. There were no engines, and so uh, there wasn't much thought about having a transom for any reason. And uh, and boats were, had just come out of, had grown out of a tradition of double enders from the Viking era, and uh, and uh, and just uh, remained so uh, for a thousand years afterwards. And Jay, uh, what's the uh, relative cost of building this way versus other methods? If you could discuss that a little bit. Uh, in my opinion, uh, lap strake construction is possibly the most reasonable type of construction for a person to consider because um, once uh, the stack of planking has been purchased, which needs to be high quality, of course, and will cost some money. Uh, but that's very, very important to get high quality, air dried, uh, beautiful material. And then uh, the framing material also needs to be good quality, uh, air dried, uh, and then a couple of boxes of rivets and roves and some nails. Um, the uh, the materials needed for the boat are, uh, although they are expensive, it's not a great volume. And so if you get the right wood and uh, get just what you need for the project, uh, beyond that, there aren't many other expenses, except when the boat's built and some finishing, varnish or uh, oils, uh, paint, that sort of thing, and then, then uh, the oars and the rig, of course, or something else, but uh, but what what isn't necessary in lap strake, which I think makes it so delightful, is is there isn't very much waste uh, uh, with modern lap strake. When one considers uh, glued uh, glued lap strake, for example, automatically one gets into a need for brushes and thinner and epoxy and um, asking you know t- uh, tape and uh, and uh, l- lots of uh, disposables and a lot an awful lot of I found in the few that I've built there was just a tremendous amount of waste uh, in that department of materials that had to be purchased and then thrown away that didn't become part of the boat and in traditional lap strake what you purchase goes into the boat and becomes the boat. And so it's more efficient in many ways than some of these, um, at least the glued lap strake methods that I've been exposed to. So I would say uh, the cost of lap strake is right in there, uh, certainly worth considering, and if done correctly, very reasonable. Very good. I, I like that analogy uh, of everything you purchase pretty much goes into the boat without much waste because. I've done some of the glued lap strake, and you know they work well, but there is a lot of waste from that type of building. That that was one thing that struck me. Uh, although it does, it has certainly uh, uh, other advantages, and uh, a lot of people uh, enjoy that, and thousands have been built. Uh, but uh, coming from the more traditional uh, methods, I see that uh, uh, the the waste. It was something that bothered me, boxes of gloves and a lot of brushes and a lot of mixing cups, and it just seemed to go on and on. Yeah, exactly. 
How about the uh, the amount of time to build with this method compared to others, Jay? I think, again, it is uh, right in the ballpark with anything else. Uh, it is because it has developed out of a, uh, a system which was very efficient and where the end goal was to get the boat built quickly and out to sea to catch fish to keep the family alive. Uh, not a lot of time was was to be wasted. And so the, uh, uh, there isn't a lot of prep time in lofting uh, and uh, building molds out of material, which, again, would have to be purchased and then is not used uh, after the boat is, is built, uh, to just set aside. So in a way, uh, one with lap straight can just, get a hold of the materials, begin building the backbone, and get right into the nitty-gritty uh, without a lot of uh, unnecessary uh, study or preparation or building parts and molds and uh, that sort of thing. So I I think that uh, if there was a race to the end, that Lap Strike would be uh, one candidate that might be the winner. Okay. And Jay, we haven't discussed it yet, but when you joined... Uh dimensional lumber and it shrinks and swells with moisture and temperature changes you try to keep the whole water tight how do you address that with traditional lap straight well one of the uh, one of the delightful aspects of lap strake is that the joints don't open up because they the planks are riveted together and cannot open uh, there is no caulking uh, as in Carvel, where ships had to be uh, hauled out and then careened on a beach and then uh, reefed of their uh, caulking and then re and then the seams had to be paid with uh, tar and pitch and uh, some sort of uh, barrier to keep the moisture away from the, the, the caulking material. In Labstrake, none of that is necessary. There is a caulk used, and traditionally it was uh, sheep's wool um, yarn used in the lap, which essentially formed a gasket um, along the rivet line and helped keep that that joint uh, watertight. But the swelling and uh, shrinking the uh, that that occurs throughout the seasons every year. Um, it changes the planks are of course affected by that, but but because they are riveted together, the seams do not open up. Interesting. Okay. So Jay, what other uh, advantages or disadvantages do you see with uh, lap strike building that we haven't discussed? Anything else? Well, I think we've. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I, it's tough for me to be objective because this is the, the boat building <laughs> tradition that I was apprenticed in when I was young, and so it's my first love, and I believe in it firmly yeah. uh, as a wonderful type of construction, and uh, I will always speak in favor of it probably over and above any other kind of construction because I know it best. Um. Uh, as far as as um, any negatives about it, probably uh, people would would be apt to say that it requires a little bit higher skill level than than maybe some other types of construction. Uh, we've we've touched on that a little bit. I think with with patience uh, and given the time, uh, the details. Uh, most people can master the details if they are, if they're willing to to give it what it takes. Um, one of the uh, disadvantages today is that one really needs some beautiful material, and uh, not just off the rack at the box store uh, pieces of wood which have been tortured and kiln dried and. Uh, and fine boat building material is becoming more and more rare on our planet. Um, it's still available. Now, one really needs to search it out 
and make sure that that he's getting the right the right stuff and the good stuff. Um, so sometimes getting the materials can be a challenge. Um, in in I think some parts of North America more than others, uh, probably more available on the coasts and a little more difficult in the Midwest or inland in places. Um, that's probably one of the disadvantages of Lapstrake is that it it really demands um, the most exceptional materials available. Jay, on a related question, uh, does one use flat grain, uh, quarter sawn, or other uh, grain woods for the strakes on a Lapstrake boat? On the, on the planking, as far as the grain, uh, quarter sawn is not necessary. It uh, was used by the Vikings in uh, planking in oak because it uh, didn't check, and also because they were splitting the planking out of uh, radially out of large logs. But that's all history, and that's really not applicable today. Um, in selecting planking, uh, many of my uh, teachers, uh, masters in Norway and Denmark, would uh, actually prefer flat grain because it has more tensile strength and uh, less is less apt to split and check uh, than a vertical grain or a quarter sawn plank. Interesting. Jay, let's uh, talk about your company and stuff for a minute here. We'll get a little plug-in for Espoia Boats. Uh, tell me what you do there and give me some contact information for those listening. Yes, at, at, here at Espoia, uh, we specialize in lap strake and have for 34 years, uh, mostly out of the Scandinavian tradition. My uh, early apprentices were in Norway and then in Denmark and the Faroe Islands. So I've brought those traditions, all three of those traditions, into uh, what we build here at the shop. Most boats are under 36 feet. Um, however, at, at, uh, currently we have a very large uh, commission, a 56-foot double-ended Viking ship out in a pavilion behind the shop. And so uh, we build all sizes. Uh, of lap straight, traditional, um, with rivets, and we've uh, also done a lot of research about trunnels, so we trunnel fasten the framing, uh, much as it was done a thousand years ago, uh, and, and uh, what we really specialize in is historic, <coughs> historic vessels, uh, 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 because it's uh, it's the most fascinating work, and and the vessels uh, are really really unique, and uh, we we enjoy stepping back in time and building uh, the way people did hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So that's that's really what we're we're about here at Ospoia is uh, is building traditional lap strake. And what's your phone number there, Jay? The phone number here is three six zero two nine three. Two zero three four. Okay, and then I was going to ask too. You did a couple workshops this year. Do you have any plan for the future? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm certain that we'll do some workshops. We may do one or two as early as October, or November this year, this fall, uh, 2013, and uh, typically again in the spring in April. Uh, those seem to be the best time for uh, for a one day workshop here at Ospoia. and that uh, that is uh, restricted to eight students uh, because of the number of benches we have and tools here, and we make it a full day, uh, and uh, the student will be introduced to and expected to execute most every aspect of uh, small lap strake boat construction in the course of one Saturday. So each student has a bench and a handful of tools and a, a few pieces of planking and framing and some trunnel stock and and we just uh, 
uh, work like little madmen all day to uh, to put together a section of a lap strike boat, and the students go home then with that experience and uh, 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 really pretty well equipped to begin building a small lap strike boat on their own if they choose to. Very nice. And Jay, I was going to mention too that you uh, there's a couple of articles in Wooden Boat Magazine number 234, which is September October of 2013. There's one article specifically about you, and then there's another article that you wrote about a gentleman um, in the Hebrides. Is that right? That's right. Uh, I I was really fortunate to meet uh, John McCauley, uh, a, a now a recently retired boat builder in the Outer Hebrides on the Isle of Harris, and uh, uh, did a, a an informal interview with him. Uh, at his shop and in his home there in the Hebrides. And then uh, he was just such a charming individual and had such wonderful little gems of historical uh, information about the boats in that region and the history and the fishing, the fishery uh, that existed uh, uh, in in uh, the uh, 19th century, 18th century. So after having scratched down some notes, I put together an article kind of as an overview of his life and the history of the boats in his region. And, and that is also in uh, the same September-October issue of Wooden Boat this year, 2013. Yeah. yeah, and I would encourage people listening to uh, check out both those articles. A great article about Jay and his history of apprenticing in Norway and the things he's doing, and then this other article is excellent too. So that's pretty exciting for you, Jay. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, extremely flattered and uh, honored to be um, to be featured there, and uh, um, hope to do uh, more articles about other boat builders around uh, the world. Uh, it's just uh, it's a continuing education for me, <clears throat> and um, we'll just hope to keep it going. So do you have other trips planned, Jay, to visit other boat builders? I'm just curious. I do. I uh, hope to uh, to do a couple of interviews in uh, central Norway, uh, maybe as early as this fall, if I can arrange it. Um, I do know builders there better than anywhere else. Uh, and uh, there's there's just an awful lot of information about the forest, the use of the trees, the application of certain parts of the trees in certain parts of the boats, um, which way the plank is turned to be used to its best advantage in the boat. There's a lot of folklore that we are at risk of losing if it's not captured soon, I think. And so that's what drives me to interview these people, is to catch as much of that as I can uh, before it's gone. Can I jump in your suitcase for one of those trips, Jay? <laughs> I'd like to. Yeah. I'd like to go along with my recorder, even if it's a Norwegian. Just get it, get it, uh, get a recording of it. Well, we can certainly talk about that, Dan. Uh, it most of these guys, uh, actually, none of these guys speak English. But that's neither here nor there. It's uh, yeah. It's getting. The, it's you know. It's getting the goods. Uh, and getting it down, uh, because this stuff goes way, way back, and I don't know if uh, the young people today have very much interest in it. So Yeah, that, I, that's awesome that you're kind of documenting some of this stuff, which is kind of what I'm doing a little bit with this type of recording, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course, the same, right. Yeah, so, uh, well, I really appreciate your time today, Jay, and uh, I keep up the great work there in Anacortes, and I look forward to seeing you at the festival next week in Port Townsend. All right, Dan. Okay, well, Very good. Uh, I'll see you in a week or so. Okay, great. Thanks, Jay. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jay, for doing an awesome job on that interview. It was really fun to get all the history on the different boat building methods and talk specifically about Laps Drake and what the options are there and how Really, it's a very doable method. It does take some patience, and you have to learn some skills, but once you do that, it's not very daunting. I mean, think of it this way, folks. I built a glued plywood lap strike boat, my first real boat in the 90s, and I made it through. I've still got the boat, and it's still in one piece. So 
Anyway, thanks again, Jay. I appreciate you doing that. And we will have more Interview the Expert episodes coming up here in the near, near future because we've got three more methods to cover. So stay tuned for that. Well, I always like it when people shoot me emails, tell me what they're up to. Uh, you can email me, dan, at hookedonwoodenboats.com. You can leave blog comments on my website if it was working. Unfortunately, it's not working right now. Somebody just brought that to my attention, so I will be working on fixing that this week. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, and YouTube. If you look for Wooden Boat Dan there, and if you go to my website, on the right-hand side, there's a little button you can click, and you can leave a message from your computer. If you have a question or would like to leave feedback about the podcast, you've got 90 seconds to do it there. Also, if you'd like to help support me, it's not like I'm making a bunch of money off this. I've made, I think, $500 this year of income, and my expenses are more than that. So I'm upside down, but that's okay. But if you do enjoy the podcast and you want to help out a little bit, if you make purchases from Amazon, Jamestown Distributor, or West Marine, if you go to my website homepage and click on the banners there for those companies and then make your purchase of anything on those websites, I get paid a small commission. I would appreciate it. There's also a store on my website. If you go to the menu and it says gear there, that takes you to a site where you can buy hats, t-shirts, mugs, things like that. I make a little bit of money on that. And also, I would appreciate it if you enjoy the podcast. If you go to iTunes, the podcast section, look for hookedonwoodenboats.com and leave me a review there. And you can also subscribe to the podcast at that same spot. Well, thanks again, again for tuning in today, folks. Great to uh, chat with you about wooden boats and getting in the wooden boat game. And again, if you're not in, it's high time you get in, folks. Shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Seriously, dan at hookedonwoodenboats.com or leave me a voice message directly on my website. Have a great week. Keep the bright side up and the barnacled side down. Wooden Boat Dan, over and out. God bless.